Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator at McNally Robinson Booksellers in Winnipeg. We're broadcasting tonight from Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'd like to thank all of uh, you joining us live here in the Zoom webinar, and uh, all of you watching now on YouTube, uh, both now and in the future, as this video will remain up if you'd like to revisit it or share it with anyone else who was unable to make it. We are here, of course, tonight to celebrate the publication of Grain Elevators, Beacons of the Prairies, a beautiful work of a photography from photographer Chris Attrell with um, words by Christine Hanlon. And we'll be hearing from both of those folks later on this evening. I'd like to express my gratitude to McIntyre Purcell Publishing Incorporated, uh, particularly Vernon at McIntyre Purcell, for all their help in uh, pulling this evening together, making it possible, and of course, for publishing the book in the first place. So we're very grateful indeed. Just to give you a few uh, quick notes about how this evening will progress, if you are joining us here in Zoom, please do feel free to offer any comments you might have uh, in the chat, uh, which you can access just by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you do have any pleasant things to say for either of tonight's participants, I will be sharing those comments with them afterwards, so please feel free to put them in there. There will also be time for questions at the close of tonight's presentation. Uh, if you have questions specifically, please just put those in the Q&A box, which you'll find just at the bottom of the screen also. That'll just ensure that all the questions are in one place and very easy to locate. And we'll put those to uh, both of tonight's featured guests as uh, we have the opportunity to do so. Um, copies of Grain Elevators are available from both McNally Robinson Booksellers in Winnipeg and in Saskatoon. You can uh, visit us in person, you can order books online, and you can also call us over the phone. I'll set, put some of that information in the chat in just a moment so that you have access to it. Um, but uh, please do feel free to get in touch with us and we'll be sure that a copy of the book finds its way to you. We deliver both nationally, locally as well, and internationally via Canada Post. So one way or another, we'll ensure that you get a copy of this book. Uh, but that's more than enough for me. Uh, we're going to move on to the uh, main portion of the evening. So that'll include a presentation from Chris Attrell, the photographer, uh, followed by a uh, conversation with Chris and Christine, where I'll be asking them a few questions. And then the opportunity will come for you to ask some questions. So uh, Chris Attrell is the author of the best-selling book, Forgotten Saskatchewan, the most popular photo book in Canada for 2019. His work has been featured in the National Post, Galleries West magazine, The Weather Network, Saskatoon Star Phoenix, Regina Leader Post, Calgary Herald, Fine Lifestyles magazine, Prairie Post, and CBC Saskatchewan. Exhibits of his work have been shown in galleries across the prairies. Please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Chris Attrell. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm Chris Attrell. I live here in Shaunavon, Saskatchewan, and I'm just going to share my screen here so you can see some of the pictures that come from the book. I assume this is working really well. You should see some grain elevator pictures. So my journey with grain elevators, it's really weird because I was never a prairie person. Most of my life, I lived in big cities. But when I was, a, when I was really little, like eight years old, that's the first time I ever bought a camera. And it just happened to be that my family moved to Spruce Grove, Alberta. My dad was in the oil industry. So that's my first time I remember being in awe of these amazing big structures. Um, with, oh, I'm just, oh, there we go. I'm <laughs> just making sure that the pictures were going. But that's where my journey really started because I found these, these buildings to be very fascinating. And every time we drove around, every other town had a row of them. Some of the smaller ones only had one or two. And I remember one time when I was a kid, before we left Spruce Grove, we took a trip down to Arizona and Los Angeles. And I remember thinking, this is horrible. These poor towns down here in California don't have grain elevators. And I just remember thinking how sad that was because I thought these were great buildings and everybody should have one, but I didn't know what they were. I just was always fascinating. To me, they were like little art forms on the prairies. Then I ended up moving back down to the States and I, and I lived briefly in a small town called Sydney, Montana. It's about a two hour drive south of the Saskatchewan border in Montana, but it's very much like a prairie town. And it did have grain elevators. So once again, I got my little excitement with that. But then as an adult, I moved back to Canada. 
and I lived in Calgary. They still had grain elevators in the 90s, just about everywhere you went. But by the time I started getting a car and driving out into the country, I noticed that a lot of towns did not have grain elevators anymore. And then I came across Champion, Alberta, the very day they were tearing theirs down. And that's why I sort of got this idea in my head that, oh, they must be getting rid of these. And then I actually made trips up to the country since 2003 just to go take pictures of grain elevators. And then it just happens that I have a relative who lives in a town called Wallanisa, Manitoba. And I went out there to go visit them. And the grain elevator in Wallanisa and Treesbank were both gone. But I remembered both of them from when I was a kid because my um, relative's husband worked at the grain elevator. So that's when I really started taking it seriously. So the photos in the book are like pretty much a collection of grain elevator pictures I've been taking over the past 18 years. And over time, my photography skills have gotten better. So I started shooting them at night, but I also shoot them all seasons. I didn't want just a photo book of pictures where all the grain elevators were shot in the middle of the day in the middle of summer because grain elevators are uh, year round. Um, they're, they're used all years. So all these pictures that you see in the book, most of them were shot in the past three years, but a lot of them are pretty old. And I visited every region of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and I even picked up a couple of them in BC. I was very surprised to know that there's a location in BC with two grain elevators with a mountain backdrop in Creston. I call it Creston, Saskatchewan because it looks just like Saskatchewan except for those uh, mountains in the backdrop. But again, I'm so glad I shot some of them because like this one here in Brandon, I believe it was just recently torn down or is in the process of being torn down. And a lot of the grain elevators in this book are no longer standing anymore. We're not losing them as fast as we were like 10 years ago, but we still lose about 10 to 20 of them a year. But I would estimate in my head, there's probably only about 300 to 350 of them left. There's a website called grainelevators.ca run by Steve Boyko. And it's a really good resource for finding out which grain elevators still stand. And he's done an amazing job with that. But I tried to capture uh, not just the grain elevator, the, the photos of the grain elevator. I tried to give you a snapshot of what these towns looked like, or you can imagine what they looked like when they were very important buildings. Cactus Lake, Saskatchewan, it's pretty much dissolved into a ghost town ever since they closed their grain elevator. There's no services anymore. Very few people live there. But these were at one point the center of economic activity for like 13 kilometers in all directions. And a lot of them are now just sitting like this one in a field in the middle of nowhere in Southwest Manitoba. So I wanted to capture more than just the, the cool, as I call them, prairie art forms to sort of give um, a little bit of a snapshot. Because for younger generations, they don't, not, they don't know what these buildings are anymore because they, they're all concrete terminals now. And of course, some, some of them have been preserved, like here in Castor, Alberta, they preserved it. So that makes it a little bit easier and sort of, sort of highlight these places that anybody can go and visit right now and go see the in, inside, outside. Some of them like this one's been bought by farmers and they still use it. It must be very hard to get a repair person for grain elevators now though. There's probably not very many of them left, but some of these farmers still buy them and they're in great shape. This one was torn down because they become hazards and the insurance on them is really expensive. So I don't blame them for tearing them down and I know they can't save all of them. And then last year we had that comet Neowise. So I made sure I went and got a shot with a grain elevator. That's Climax Saskatchewan. And this photo is in the book as well. I've I'm very nocturnal, like I love being up late at night. So that's why you're gonna also see a lot of night photos because I just naturally stay up late, always have my whole life. I'm not an early morning person. Oh yeah, there's Creston, BC. Can you believe that? I can't believe there's two of these big Alberta wheat pool grain elevators, or I guess one's a UGG with this wonderful backdrop. And right now I found out they're restoring them. So now they're, right now they're under construction as a restoration project. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of them, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. I understand this one is just, this one's near Winnipeg, just southwest of Winnipeg. And someone said, this is in the process of being torn down. 
So I feel very glad about sort of capturing that snapshot of the prairie history. Oh yeah, Cypress River, that one's going to. So um, as far as the photography part goes, that's the story that I'm trying to tell. Um, and I hope I did a good job. And so as I think that's been eight minutes. Was there anything else I should add there, uh, John? No, I'd say that works out nicely, Chris, and uh, I'm sure some other things will come up over the course of our conversation, too. Uh, so I would like to just kind of start, uh, first of all, by introducing our your, the person who's written some of the text for the book as well and inviting her to join us. Uh, so Christine Hanlon is the best-selling author of Old Winnipeg, Out of Old Manitoba Kitchens, the co-author of the Manitoba Book of Everything, and curator writer for Everything Manitoba, the ultimate book of lists. So I'd ask you all to join me in welcoming our second guest for tonight, Christine Hanlon, to say a few words. Well, first of all, thank you uh, to everyone for being here. And uh, I just want to say what a privilege it, it is to be part of this book. I was truly honored when uh, McIntyre Purcell asked me to contribute the text to Chris's book on uh, grain elevators. Um, they started by sending me a coffee, copy of uh, Chris's previous book, Forgotten Saskatchewan, and uh, the photos were just amazing. I mean, just like in, in the Grain Elevator book, they're, they're two works of art. Uh, Chris is so enormously talented. Um, and as, as he mentioned, the, the photographs aren't just beautiful. They are a powerful way to tell a story, to tell the story of the prairies. So at first, when I was looking at them, I, I just, I wondered what I could possibly add to them because they are so powerful. But then I started to see that to see the photos of the grain elevators as an entry point for uh, fleshing out the story that they tell. And I hope I've done them justice uh, by providing some context, a bit of backstory and some interesting details that span the time from the earliest beginning to, uh, to the place they occupy today. And as uh, Chris said, so many of them are disappearing from our landscapes. Um, and if you've grown up on the prairies, well, I grew up on the prairies and, and the grain elevators have always been a part of, of my life. Uh, but I admit I knew very little about them. So this was a real journey of discovery for me. And uh, just like Chris said, I discovered that the, the grain elevators played a really central role in the development of the prairies um, uh, by making it possible to, to efficiently store and move the grain. Uh, they made it possible for the prairies to become the breadbasket of Canada and for Canada to become um, a major exporter of grain to the world, which is still is today. And the towns that were built around the grain elevators, as, as Chris was saying, you know, because farmers brought their crops to be picked up by the railway, they, they, those grain elevators became really the center of the town and, and people got together there. So, and um, you really get a sense of the prairie way of life from, from looking at the, the photos. Um, that's something that really comes through so clearly in Chris's photographs, uh, which is what I think makes this book so very special. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christine. I'll invite uh, Chris to rejoin us as well, and then we can just uh, chat a little bit more about this book. Uh, well, while Chris is rejoining us, uh, Christine, I can I ask you a question then possibly? Sure. Uh, I was just wondering what challenges you personally faced while uh, researching grain elevators in the three provinces, because you yourself had to uh, do quite a bit of research, I'd imagine, to work on the text that accompanies these photos. I did. As I said, I didn't know a whole lot about grain elevators when I started. And actually, if you can't be seen, that's four provinces. Um, so Chris sent me a list and, and the photos of the, all the elevators that would be in the book, about 120 of them. So get me busy. And I tackled them one by one, uh, starting with the ones in uh, Manitoba. Uh, growing up in Manitoba, as I said, grain elevators were always part of the landscape. So I knew that they were important and that they were an important part of our heritage here in the province. And of course, other people might have heard me say this before, my go-to place for Manitoba history is always the Manitoba Historical Society website, just a treasure trove of, of information. And I also reached out to Gordon Goldsboro, the president of the Manitoba Historical Society. 
And he assured me that I could probably find information on most, maybe even all the Manitoba's grain elevators on the site. Uh, and he also happens to write a column for the uh, Manitoba Cooperator on grain elevators. And then he contributed a lot of that information on the site. Uh, at the same time, uh, Gordon very generously sent me the PDF of um, the late Jim Pearson's books uh, called Vanishing Sentinel. And um, they're an amazing collection. I mean, they document, I, I kid you not, the construction, renovation, and the changing ownership, the, the capacity, everything you wear of every grain elevator ever constructed in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. It's truly amazing. Uh, there's a write-up about Jim in the book. I think you'd probably find it interesting. Um, he left such a valuable legacy. I can't even begin to imagine how many hours he must have spent because he, he went to see all those grain elevators. Uh, and how many kilometers he must have traveled to see each and every one of them. Probably the only person that's come close is Chris, because <laughs> he went and took pictures of them, right? Um, the only thing about Jim's information is that it is very factual. So it was very limited. It was location, ownership, dates, construction, you know, renovation, expansion, the capacity. You know. So... I wanted to get a little bit more media information. So I went and I cross-referenced uh, what I read in Jim's books with uh, what I found on the website. And, and Chris has mentioned one of them, uh, grainelevators.ca, fantastic website. Um, there's also two Facebook pages that I, I checked out, one called Vanishing uh, Sentinels, the other one, Prairie Icons. And finally, a very unusual page I stumbled across called bigdoer.com. Uh, yeah, and it was an unusual name. But after consulting Jim's books, I usually start with the grain elevators, um, but I couldn't find, so I had actually multiple screens um, set up and I was looking across. I actually herniated a disc in my neck from looking at all the screens, but that's, that's another story. So um, yeah, so sometimes I could find the elevators on the grain elevator.ca. Sometimes I checked up the Facebook pages um, and then I've looked them up on, on Big Door. Now I should tell you about Big Door. Uh, it's Chris Door and Connie Biggert. Uh, they write about their travels through the Prairie Provinces. So they kind of do what Chris does, I guess, and what uh, Jim did. They explore small towns and their buildings, including of course, the grain elevators. So the biggest challenge I had with all of this information on all these screens is that sometimes I wasn't sure if I had the right elevator because as Chris said, some towns have more than one. So then I'd be texting Chris and asking him, you know, do I have the right one? Is this the one in the picture? So, and he was great. He'd always get back to me and help me out. So we, we figured out which ones they were. Uh, the other challenge was that not all the information from the different sources aligned every time. So there were contradictions sometimes so what I decided to do is I didn't include any information that was contradictory. And I just moved on and included the information that I could be sure about. So it was kind of like playing detective, but uh, it was a lot of fun. And I just want to say that, you know, all the information in the book is a product of a lot of work from a lot of very passionate, passionate and dedicated people. And uh, I'm just really lucky that they wrote it all down. Thanks. No, that is fantastic. Uh, there is such an incredibly vibrant uh, community and network of uh, folks that are doing uh, so much hard work to bring all this information together, which is why it's so wonderful to see it consolidated in works of art, such as the one that uh, Chris and yourself have pulled together too. Mm -hmm. Now I do see uh, Chris is back with us. Chris, would you like to uh, join us? Oh, fabulous. Yes. We had a power outage. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> no, what timing? <laughs> Sorry about that. No, not a problem at all. I'm delighted that you're still with us. So that's perfect. Uh, so I'll just ask you a very quick question. I was just chatting to Christine a little bit and I'll circle around with some questions for her as well throughout this. Uh, but Chris, you've spent an awful lot of time exploring Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. What attracted you to the subject of grain elevators? What was that initial spark that drew you to them? Actually, to be honest, it was just because of the way the buildings looked. 
they were so colorful back when I was a kid. Like there's green ones, orange ones, white ones. And they were kind of mysterious because I didn't know what they did. No, that makes a lot of sense. There's something very fascinating about the object of the grain elevator as well, how it straddles the uh, the kind of the, the history of our provinces as well too, but with an eye toward modernism and modern movements as well. It's this incredible combination of the past and this uh, futurist quality to them as well. That's really endlessly fascinating. Uh, what is it about grain elevators that seems to evoke such emotions for those who travel through the Canadian West? Well, I think a lot of them, like for me, um, whenever I'm traveling through the prairies, like I've become like, Ever since I got my camera in 2003, my first digital one, I've become like a prairie junkie. I love back roads in the prairies. I love going to all these small towns. And when they do have a grain elevator, you can see that town from 20 kilometers away. So you know you're getting close to it. So I think it's when it's missing, it just sort of feels like there's some, you know, there's some, it just doesn't feel right. And it takes a little bit of adjustment. Here in Shaunavan, we have two grain elevators. They've been here the whole time, but I can't imagine driving to Shaunavan and not seeing those two shiny silver grain elevators anymore. So I think that's one of the reasons, and also because of the fact that it is just like an economic center of the town, or it was for many decades. Oh, right. Now, I'm very curious about the process for taking these images as well, and I imagine each one is quite different, but could you walk us through what a typical shoot looks like when you do come across one of the elevators? Well, I always get the first, just a simple, easy shot. That's when you just stand in front of it, take the normal one that, you know, a snapshot essentially. But then if you start walking around the town, especially from all directions, you, you can kind of get a sense of like, based on the lighting time of day season, where you can get like a really cool angle, you get some really nice visual weight. And you often want to have a little bit of the town when you can in the picture so it kind of gives it some context like it's in town and not just out in some field somewhere so there is a little bit of an explore exploration process where you do get out and you walk around however for the first few years i oftentimes would just shoot at the car window but then my wife told me not to do that anymore and she was right <laughs> Well, it is really incredible. And further to your comment on that as well, there is uh, there are certainly some of the elevators that are very isolated and outside of the town, but those that are surrounded by community, you, uh, despite the fact that the human figure doesn't really figure into your photographs that much, you re do really get a sense of livelihood and life around them as well. So I think you capture that really spectacularly in your photographs. Now, do you feel that your work is helping to preserve these structures for posterity or does that play a part in it? I'm not really so sure that I do because I know that you can't really save them all. The ones where they are being saved, there's a really strong community support already. But now that there's, there's so much time just between when they stopped using them until this point, that maybe now there's some awareness that some of these can and possibly should be saved because I'm pretty sure that in another 20 years, only like 10 to 20 percent of the ones still standing will still be there. So maybe from this point forward, this will turn out to be that way, but some just can't be saved. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. Now, you've explored rural Saskatchewan in uh, your best-selling book that we mentioned earlier, Forgotten Saskatchewan, and now you've examined the disappearing grain elevators. Have you kind of come up with what your next project might be just yet? Well, I, I really love old historical buildings, and I really love... <clears throat> you know, the, the history of, you know, most of these communities and cities in the Prairie Provinces. So I am kind of working on one. We're just going to be a lot of these really cool, stately, old buildings, but shot at night. I love night photography. It is my favorite one. So that could be anywhere from like big cities, small towns to rural places. So I think my next one's going to be a collection of cool buildings, but shot at night. Fantastic. And uh, certainly uh, is assisted by your... Uh, draw toward nightlife as well. <laughs> now, are any of the grain elevators that you photograph still in operation? And if so, how did you go about, uh, did you have to work specifically with the organizations involved in the grain elevators to take the shots at all? Was there any collaboration in that regard? Well, no, there's still a lot of them being used. Like even one of the ones here in Shondavan is still being used. Not that many, but there are still some. But you don't really need to get any like permission or work with the people because you're not really trespassing or going on private property. However, some grain elevators like in Bents, Saskatchewan, it's a ghost town. It is on private property. So that picture's not in the book, 
because they, they gave me permission, but then they didn't want it in the book because they didn't want other people, you know, coming to their town. But I didn't really have to work with anybody. And they never, and even if I tried to, they're either really, really busy or they're not there because it's very seasonal. Right. So I didn't really attempt to do that. No, that makes perfect sense. Now, I'll invite Christine to join us again as well, uh, just because I have uh, two quick questions for both of you. And uh, just as a reminder to everybody, oh, and uh, there we go, and Chris as well, uh, just a reminder to all of you folks that are here in the webinar with us as well, if you have any questions, please do write them in the Q&A or write them in the chat, uh, because there will be time for uh, questions from you folks in just a moment as well. Uh, but this is a question that uh, can work for both of you as well. I was wondering if each of you could uh, tell us one of the most interesting facts that you discovered while either on your photographic journey or while researching the text for the book, Christine. And uh, Christine, why don't you go first? Well, one of the most important, interesting things I found out was why a grain elevator is called a grain elevator or an elevator. And that's because at the heart of the elevators is something called a leg. And the leg is this conveyor belt with little cups and it scoops up the grain and it elevates it to the top of the grain elevator, to the top of the building, and then drops it into the appropriate bin. So that was, uh, I think that's probably one of the more interesting things that I found. And there were lots more. And Chris, what's one of the most interesting uh, facts that you stumbled across while engaged in your own photographic journey? Well, mine's more like historical. Now I know why there's a town every 13 kilometers. Yes. When they built the railroads, there wasn't cars yet. So they put up a grain elevator or set up a town every 13 kilometers because that's pretty much as far as you could travel with a horse and a trailer to carry all your grain to a grain elevator. If it was just the cars were invented like 15 years earlier, I'm sure every town would have been 25 or 30 kilometers away from each other. Oh, that makes everything make a lot of sense, honestly. So thank you for that. Um, now, here's a question for both of you as well. Why do you think it is so important to preserve these structures? And um, as a secondary part to that, um, have any been already preserved as heritage sites or as museums? And anyone can go. Uh, oh, sure. Okay. Well, they do have a bunch that are, are already like, like there's one in Spruce Grove, Alberta, St. Albert. Um, and I think one in Manitoba is Austin, Manitoba. And in Saskatchewan, we've got Hepburn. There's probably at least a dozen to two dozen of them that are saved and preserved. And I do think it's a great idea, although I'm pretty sure it's expensive to do, just because like one day there, those will be the only ones left because weather is, we're losing about three or four elevators a year just to wind. And we've lost, it. they've blown the tops off a few of them here in Saskatchewan. So yeah, I like the, I, I admire the people who are preserving some of them. Yeah, actually, we went to see one this uh, um, summer. We went to uh, Plum Coulee. There's uh, also a green elevator in Plum Coulee that you can go into. And it's actually that elevator is in the book. And uh, yeah, it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I, I got to see the leg. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, it is such an important part of our history. Uh, I mean, we couldn't have become uh, this massive economic um, heartland um, this breadbasket without the grain elevator. Because I, I, in the beginning, what, what, when I was doing my research, in the beginning, they were bringing the, the uh, grain with sacks, right, to the, to the edge of the railway and then loading it onto the rail cars. And I mean, that's a, the kind of things you learn when you go and visit a grain elevator uh, museum. And, and there are so many of them, as Chris was saying. You know, um, so when they decided that they were going to use uh, gravity and and pour the grain in bulk into the grain cars, it changed everything. And that's where we that's how our history happened here in the prairies. Right. So I think I'm a big believer in that um, to understand where you're going, you have to understand where you came from. And I think the uh, grain elevators have a lot to tell us about that. No, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Steve Boyko as well, who in the chat pointed out that, as you mentioned, uh, Christine, Plum Cooley, and uh, Austin and Warren in Manitoba are museums as well. Too. So you could certainly check those out if you're interested. Um, Christine, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the collaborative process with Chris on this book and how it was to work with him on it. 
Well, it was a real pleasure and uh, honor, I want to say once again, to, uh, to work with Chris on this book. Um, his photographs from the beginning really just took my breath away. Not only are they beautiful, but they really draw you in, as you were saying, John. You know, uh, and it was so exciting when Chris sent me the photos that went with the list, because in the beginning, I just had the list, so I was going in kind of blind. But once the photos arrived, um, it became more clear where the, the story would be. Um, then, as I mentioned earlier, there were several instances where I it was hard to match the descriptions I was reading about with the actual grain elevators. So it was really nice to, that uh, I was able to communicate with Chris, uh, text him and, and confirm that I had the right elevator. Um, and Chris as, is a person of few words though. Uh, and, and he's also very humble. Um, so even though he has this enormous talent um, and when I, I'm sure I must have told him that I was uh, using grainelevators.ca to do the research, but what he didn't tell me was that he's the one who started the website. And I only found this out when I was preparing for, for tonight, actually. And uh, then uh, I think Steve Boyko has taken over that, uh, that website, as Chris mentioned. And, um, and uh, Steve was also the copy editor for this book. Um, I thank him as well for, for all his help. Fabulous. Uh, so we do have a question from one of our audience members. So uh, Teresa Lee Cook, hello, Teresa Lee, uh, was just wondering, and uh, this can be for either of you if you have any idea. Uh, she noticed that one of the grain elevators said Patterson. I was wondering if that was related to the shipping company that transported grain from the lakehead, Thunder Bay, across the Great Lakes. I'm not really sure myself. Do you have any idea, Christine? Uh, yes, I think that it's a Patterson Grain Company. Um, that it, it's a large um, grain company that uh, that moves grain from and and I know that a lot of actually some of the big grain uh, some of the big companies had terminals at the lakehead and uh, I probably still do. No, that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for that. And uh, we are just reaching the end of my own questions as well. I have uh, one more that I'm going to ask in just a second. So again, if anybody in the audience does have any further questions, please do pop them in. But otherwise, I was wondering if uh, each of you could speak to uh, whether or not you had your own favorite grain elevator uh, yourself or your favorite place to see grain elevators as well. And Chris, uh, did you want to go first? Sure. Well, Oh, I like them all though. <laughs> so there's like, a, it's hard to really pick one that I really like. But my favorite was Dankin, Saskatchewan for the longest time because it had two really old ones. And, I, and the owner contacted me. So I got to hear a little bit about the grain elevator itself. But then the windstorm blew the tops off them. So now they're kind of like half there, half not there. So it's not really my favorite anymore. So I, I'd say that someone's pretty good. And back in 2004 and 2005, I got to go to Warner, Alberta, and Inglis, Manitoba. Each of those places still had a row of five grain elevators. Now, Warner's is only down to three or four now, but that was actually a pretty neat experience, too, just to go see the big row. Like, I used to see them when I was a kid. Yeah, Inglis is actually a national historic site uh, for grain elevators. Um, and I wanted to go there to visit them. And I, and I will, I will. But it, it's just a little far from Winnipeg. It's about five hours. So Plum Coulee was just a little closer. So that's, we went to that one. But I, I have to say, I really like that one in Dankin as well. That was the one I was going to pick. So it, it, it just has so much character. Perfect. Now, and I will point out that as soon as you started talking, Chris, Eleanor in the chat immediately uh, said, did you visit Inglis? So, <laughs> absolutely oh. correct. <laughs> yeah, I've been there a few times. The first time was 2005, back before GPSs and internet stuff. I just drove there because someone told me to. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I think that uh, kind of closes us up for this evening as well, unless there's anybody else in the uh, chat that had any questions. 
Uh, but I'm so very grateful to both of you for coming uh, here to speak a little bit more about this beautiful book. Uh, this really is just such a fascinating collection, both of history and of artistry as well. So if you're at all interested in the subject matter or just interested in the history or visual representations of the prairies, this is another fantastic book for McIntyre Purcell, who really just excel at these uh, beautiful photographic uh, collections. So again, please do visit us, uh, pick up a copy of one of the books, uh, and we'll make sure we get it into your hands. But otherwise, thank you all so very much for joining us now or in the future, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube in the days to come. And uh, thank you all very much once again. Please join me in giving a very warm but silent virtual farewell to Chris Atrell and Christine Hanlon. Thank you all. <laughs>